So uh, this, this, uh, this day, this morning, uh, we already heard from Lowell Scott on uh, cultural confusion and biblical clarity. And then we heard from Bob McEwen uh, when it, economics basically from a biblical perspective. Um, and let me start off by saying that when I use the phrase socialism, I'm not talking against uh, uh, helping people that are poor. And in the Bible, in the Old Testament and New, over and over and over, it tells us to reach out to the poor, to help the poor. It never was intended to be the government's job to do that. And when you get large government involved, it's very difficult, especially from a federal level, to also hold accountability with the help that we give to the poor through social programs. And um, so I, I for one, uh, for local, more local government, I point out that this is the United States of America, that we have governors and we have state legislation and that as a state, if we have smaller government, the state level, it helps us a lot and, and would help us get rid of some of the waste that McEwen was talking about on the video, uh, easy as P-I-E. And my title is Biblical Freedom. And whom the Son has set free shall be free indeed. Galatians talks about not going back into slavery of sin. And Paul said that in the, in, you know, in the kingdom of God, there's, there's no um, male or female, no uh, slave or free, and no uh, Jew or Greek. In other words, no racism, no sexism, and no, uh, let's see, free, let's see, male and female, uh, no slavery, right? No slavery. Um, everyone, everyone, all of us are individuals valued individually, no matter what, where we come from. And when you get to a biblical worldview, you get a biblical worldview and you look at things like life. Biblically, the Bible is very clear, life begins at conception. And that answers the questions. It begins at conception. But if you don't believe the Bible and you come up with circumstantial things and go, well, what about this and what about that and what about this? Uh, then, then you're not letting the guide of the biblical view guide your choices when you take a look, a hard look at if, what does it mean and how do we live it out if life begins at conception? And so every life is valued. Um, God doesn't value mon money. He doesn't value um, uh, the rich over the poor. He doesn't say the one should rule over the other or vice versa. Um, it's not wrong to have money. It's wrong for money to have you. It's not money that's the root of all evil. It's the love of money. Uh, he, he, he talks in James, the Bible talks in James about the, the, the people that put the rich in a proper seat and treat them differently and how they will treat the poor differently and put them in the back or maybe not pay attention to them or talk to them. And all that's wrong. So let me just say, as Christians, we care about people that are poor. That's the first thing. I just want you to understand. We care. And uh, the Bible says, you know, in fact, Jesus said, the poor will always be with you. And he says it within the context of caring for the poor. But there's also biblical principles. The Proverbs gives us a principle that it says this. It says, laziness leads to poverty. It's a principle. And it's followed up by Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10, where he says, for even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. To me, that means when you do something with a, 
a social program or to help a person, there needs to be responsibility and accountability. Some people can't do anything at all about their circumstance and they need us to help them. And it's the right thing to do as Christians to take care of the weak, the poor, the, the lame, the sick. You know, it's not wrong. In fact, in the Bible, there were multiple types of offerings and one of them was alms giving to the poor. Remember the, but the priests that were saying, look at me and just about, about image, you know, they wanted to do their praying publicly and their giving to the poor publicly and make it a, a scene because it wasn't from the heart. And as believers in God, Jesus puts the love in our heart for the poor. So I just want you to make sure you're hearing that we gotta be careful when we understand biblical economics, that part of biblical economics is God's blessing flowing through us to the poor. I'm thankful this church already at the end of August has given twice, twice as much ever in the history of the church to benevolence, over $70,000. And we're helping a lot of people that attend here as well as other people in the community. And I believe it's the right thing to do. And I know that individuals as well help other individuals not going through the church because that's who our people are. That's who Christians are. That's who people that are serious that have a love of God in their hearts. And you can come across very, very hard, unloving, hateful, elitist if you're not careful in the words you choose when discussing the world and the life right now. We need to make sure that everybody understands that we believe in reaching down and helping people and caring for those that are broken or that are hurting or that uh, are in poverty. So, so Paul tells us this, that the, the, about the working, about laziness. It's a principle. Uh, I mean, I'll just leave that. It stands on its own, but it's not an excuse for not helping poor people. So uh, Jesus says, if any, this is... Uh, in uh, Deuteronomy, it's not Jesus, Deuteronomy 15, seven to 11. If, if, any, if among you, one of your brothers should become poor in any of your towns within your land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not harden your heart or shut up your hand against your poor brother, but you shall open your hand to him and lend him sufficient for his need, whatever it may be. For the poor you will always have with you in the land. Therefore, I command you, you shall open wide your hand to your brother, to the needy and to the poor in your land. So uh, in John 12, eight, it tells us, Jesus, you will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me, Jesus said. The context of that uh, is like this. Uh, disciples Judas Iscariot was going to betray him. Asked why was the why was this perfume with the perfume that uh, that uh, Mary was putting on the feet of Jesus? Why wasn't this perfume sold for for three hundred denarii and the money given to the poor? Judas did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to take from what was put into it. And Jesus said this, leave her alone. She has kept this perfume in preparation for the day of my burial. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. So there's a context there. And so I'm not saying the context there isn't don't care about the poor. The context is this. I want you to understand we never can have a culture where people that are poor aren't in our culture. So to try to fix it where there's not rich people like Solomon and other biblical people, in a lot of people in the Bible, how about the rich guy that, that gave his burial plot to Jesus, right? And paid for the spices and took care of, of preparing him for burial. Is it wrong to be rich? No. In fact, my estimation, I've seen Wealthy people, more generous and more giving beyond measure to help people. In my personal experience, when they're Christian, I've seen it over and over again. I see it a lot of times with poor people. They give their might, 
their heart is broken. They don't have a lot to give, but when the benevolence is taken, they're at least gonna come up with a dollar somehow, even though for them, that's a sacrifice. Because it's not about being poor or rich. It's about the heart, the spirit of God in us. But the point I wanna make is that Jesus acknowledged that everyone in a nation or in the world is not gonna have equal income. And to equalize things and to bring quote unquote social justice, when you talk about social justice, there's different definitions. If the definition is treating people right and helping people, I'm okay. But if the, if, if the definition is uh, socialism, which I think is, you know, you, 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 people play, play with words and the same words mean one thing to one person in their mind, it means something different. And if it means equalizing income by saying to people, you don't have a right to make that much, here, you know, we're gonna take from you and, and equalize so that everyone is equal. We call that socialism, but it's actually, I don't believe socialism government is even a thing. I think it's communism. All it is is soft communism because it has to be administered. You have to have a ruling class and a police state to enforce the redistribution of wealth and equalizing money for all people. The heart of many people who aren't Christian have their beautiful hearts. They mean well. They want to help people. They, they, they think, why does everybody have to be so greedy? Why do you have to have so much? If we just shared evenly across the world it sounds so good and no one would ever have need of anything and we would just distribute this and we could have a socialistic society and of course the ruling class would have to make sure it stayed that way and was watching so no one got more and you'd, you'd have to enforce that. Um, and, and it just seems like, well, that might work out real good. And, um, you know, I was, I was raised in the 50s. I, I kind of have a background, I understand I have a st strong biblical worldview, but my eyes were really enlightened when I got to go to Poland. And I went to the, and I'd been already to, to, uh, uh, to see uh, the uh, concentration camps in, in Germany, but now in Poland, to Birkenau and uh, to, to look at that and see what went on and see the rooms just filled with hair of Jewish people and, and gypsies and so forth, just hair, huge rooms of just hair, of suitcases, of little bitty kids' shoes, of their clothes, all their personal effects, and to hear the stories that are true stories of where they tortured and killed people, right where they see the spot where they would put them up if they tried to escape and shoot them as an example in front of everybody, right in front of their family. I mean... You, you can't, if you can go to Poland or go to Germany, um, then I would, you know, Munich, there, there's, a, there's a concentration camp there. Um, go, go see what, it, what communism turns into. It's just like the picture we're saying, if you don't follow the leaders, if you're, you know, when they become in charge of everything and you don't do what they tell you, you kick back anything, then their answer is to take you out. Now, I know, I know Germany's a little bit different thing, but I went to Poland and I saw uh, communistic housing and there's a picture of some of housing and there's a, there's a, lot, of, a lot of these houses like this and they weren't, we're gonna paint them, but the, the economy fell apart because socialism, communism doesn't work. It's just concrete flats, one after another. They're all over uh, Krakow. Krakow's a beautiful ancient city. And uh, we saw them here. And when the wall came down because of Ronald Reagan and Margaret, Margaret Thatcher and Pope John Paul II and them working together and communism fell, remember Ronald Reagan, tear that wall down, Mr. Gorbachev. When that happened, they took in their main boulevard, right by this is a huge, they call it Ronald Reagan Way. They named their main, main boulevard after Ronald Reagan. They were very thankful. 
Um, I want to show you the, the next slide is a picture of the famous town square. If you look up Krakow, K-R-A-K-O-W, Poland, you can find other pictures of this town center. And around, this is the center building around a square. It was bustling with all kinds of things going on. And I was curious that there had to be people still alive, maybe working there, that were a part of when this was under communist rule. So I went in several different shops. And in those shops, there were individuals that still worked there today, that worked there during communism. And I struck up with conversations, not with one, two, three, four, or five, but six or seven individuals in different places. They're still working there. And I asked them what it was like under communist rule. And they said, well, the difference is, is we have things on our shelves today, ample stuff to sell. We used to have to go to work, even if we had nothing. And usually we had nothing to sell, but we showed up for work to get our government money but there was nothing on the shelf. Sometimes a little bit. And I, want, I just want you to know, we're not made to, it is insulting to have someone have to take care of us and pass down and give out money. And when you begin to equal things with socialism and communism, when you begin to make everyone equal, when it, sounds, it can sound so good, what ends up happening is you have people that, what, what's the point of becoming a doctor? Yeah, people, the government then has to say, uh, this job is, is sent, we gotta have someone. And so they start assigning you, you're gonna work here. You lose your freedom. You're gonna do this for a job. You're gonna do this for a job. And that's what begins to happen. So when you hear the term socialism thrown out, just know if the person doesn't understand the term, if they think it's a social program, you know, I understand the heart of wanting to take care of the down and out. It's us, the church's job, never meant to be the government. We have it right now. I don't agree with across the board stimulus checks. The people that are out of work, help them. But those of us that have paychecks, why would we get money from the government? This is a step in the wrong direction. And a free market inspires individuals. It opens up God's creative abilities. It gives us the freedom to work within the science or in the, the, the lane that we're, that we're gifted in. Um, you know, if you're a... If you're a, a a, a, a doctor that gives birth, you know, helps people give birth or you're a, some other kind of doctor that's got a high risk. Why would you take those risks if, why would you go through all that schooling? Why would you really care to do all of that if what you're going to get is going to be even with, with whoever else? I mean, if, you're, if you've got a certain level of education and you're, 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 you can be a school teacher, why would you ever go on and get your master's? Why would you ever go on and get your doctorate? Where is the incentive to do more? Now, I want to make sure you understand. I'm not talking about caring in a social way about people that have been beaten down or battered for whatever reason, whether it's from a parent or whatever else the case may be. But I do believe in responsibility and accountability on the part of every person that receives help. Because when we as a church or me as an individual or you for your neighbor reach to help someone, you're going to ask questions. You're going to give them more help than just money. You're going to give them help to talk to them. You're going to give them Jesus help. You're going to maybe help them uh, better themselves educationally. You're going to maybe take a look at their lifestyle, maybe take a look at their spending, take a look at their budget and teach them and help them learn to do better so that they become better citizens. So I wanted to show you that, that picture to tell you that I actually was there and saw that. And you, you, it scares you a lot when you realize once a government, we become dependent on the government, then the government's in control of you because if you don't do what they say, they don't give you what you need. And if you talk back to them, 
you're undermining the whole process and it's a, it's an absolute formula. Socialism and communism is a formula for slavery, total human disrespect of human life. It's horrible. Um, I was going to give you a few more, another story right quick before I quit. Um, you may have, you may have, uh, you know, remember the Bible parable in Matthew 25. And in the NIV, it's called the parable of the bags of gold. Uh, it's a parable of, of the talents, but a talent was a measure of money. It wasn't talent like I'm talented to sing. It's not what that's about. It's about money. And he, and he, t he talks about going on a, ju a journey and he gives, uh, uh, he trusted his wealth to three different guys. One, he gives them five bags of gold. One, two bags of gold. One, one bag of gold, okay? And this is in Matthew 25, starting in verse 14. And so when he comes back, the end of the story is this. We have... Um, the five guy, the guy with the five bags, when he comes back, he's, he's used it, invested it, worked with it. He's got 10 bags of gold. The next guy has two and he comes back and says, where's yours? He says, well, you know, I turned my two into four bags of gold. And the other one that had one, he said, well, I knew you was kind of a taskmaster and I, you know, I was a little fearful and so I buried it. He said, well, why didn't you just at least make some interest and put it in the bank? And he took in this parable from the guy that had the one bag of gold and gave it to the guy that had five and turned it into 10. And then he makes a spiritual application, which is not my point today. My point is this, in the whole parable, equal income is not even a principle here. Does that make sense? You know, you see that, you see that in, a, in throughout scripture, you see that, Equal, Jesus never tells, uh, and he's talking about the harvest in that story. And he's talking about some other things and it has eternal consequences when he gets done with it. But it just, it, it just doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't equate to the fact that, that, you know, everyone should be paid the same or that we should collect all the money in a big pot and distribute it evenly. It doesn't equate. And in, in, um, Matthew 20, there's the parable of the workers in the vineyard. And so simply in this parable, it's about nine in the morning. And uh, he says, he says, you want to go work in my vineyard? I'll pay you. See, these guys are standing around in the marketplace. They're not doing anything. And, uh, and so... And then about three in the afternoon, so the guy said, sure, he starts working at nine. And about three in the afternoon, he goes to another guy and he says, hey, would you work? And I'll pay you. He said, okay, so he went to work. Do you remember the story? The one guy worked all day long and he gave him what he agreed to give him. The other guy worked one hour and he gave him the same he gave him to the guy that worked all day. You see, when, you're, when you think that you're entitled to something. He, look what he's got. I should have that. I mean, why did I have to work all day? He got the same amount. He only worked one hour. And in the story, he says, it's my money. Who are you to say what I do with my money? And I want to say to the government, who are you to say what I do with my money? Now, I'm, I'm not against any kind of taxes. I, I, I mean, I understand they, they you know, got the roads have to be paid for somewhere. There's things you have to do. We need police force. We need other things. We need a military. I get that. But when you saw the, the graph up here about how much the government takes, if you keep it all, you're hundred percent free. If they keep it all, you're hundred percent a slave and somewhere in between, we need to understand that biblical economics and the biblical perspective isn't that every person on earth for it to be godly and for us to have love and for us to care about the poor means we all make the same. See what I'm talking about? But Jesus did talk a lot about the poor. In fact, this is gonna, you're not gonna like this part. That rich guy, he told him, he says, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And he went away sad. So here's the bottom line is 
There's two gods in Matthew 6. There's money and God. God that watches a sparrow fall and clothes the fields with lilies. And that we can trust him by putting him first. He'll take care of our food, clothing, and shelter. And there's money. So much so that the guy that gets enough decides, I just want to be fat and lazy. And he builds more barns and puts it in there, not knowing his life's going to be required of him. And the problem is, is that the issue in so many times is we don't like socialism. We don't like this kind of thing where the government makes us give them money so they can help people. But the church failed and the government's doing this because the church won't let go of that money like the rich young ruler because we're, we're, we're too close with our money and we don't want to let it flow through us. Like Pastor Lindell talked in our missions convention, let it flow through us, not only to evangelize, but to help people. So we rise up to help people and then we do it out of relationship that's responsible and accountable because God does care about the poor. There's a balance to this. There's a form of government doesn't work, socialism, communism. It'll, it, it, we saw it. McEwen just told us, he showed it to us so clear. But Christianity doesn't work with just truth. It works with love and action, and that's where you help people. But you also help people with truth when you love them and give them. You say, but this is how you've got to change, and you hold them accountable to make them. And then if they won't, the lazy don't eat. No work. No food. Now that's tough love. But there might be some other tough love in the Bible. Reject Jesus and you don't get to go to heaven. Jesus doesn't reject you. He gave his life for you. You go to hell by rejecting Jesus. That's tough, isn't it? I mean, why would God do that? Why, well, why did he give his son? Why, why would God ever send someone to hell? God doesn't send you to hell. You reject the heaven he's offered to you and paid for with his son Jesus with great suffering, sacrifice. And so sometimes people make choices that end up putting them in a place that looks like we're mean. It is not mean to hold a person responsible and accountable when you, get, you pick them up and help them. Does that make sense? And so that's the biblical way to do it. The biblical way is to do that, not through government, but through the church and um, as people. And I'm not accusing any of you of being selfish or being money grubbers or not being benevolent. I just told you our church had given an incredible amount of money just through the end of August, and we're helping a lot of people. So thank you. But socialism, when we take a look at freedom, Freedom, God doesn't want us under socialism. He doesn't want us under communism. He wants to be free, to bless us, to flow through us so we can bless others, to pour through us his blessings to go to others. That's what he wants. But we have to not just build our barn and catch it all. It has to flow through us of love, not only for the lost to give spiritual health and life, but to help people that are down and out because there will be poor always. And if God wanted everything equal, we wouldn't be talking about there being poor all the time. He would be saying, there shouldn't be poor among you. You guys should put all this together. And some people will point at the Bible and go, well, what about the end of Acts 2 where it says they took and made everything common together? They were being persecuted in this situation and it was the church and they were helping people that were losing their jobs and persecuted. They didn't have enough. They were doing what is biblical, is letting it flow through them to help the poor in their community. And we do that here. I want to tell you, if this is your church, you come first. We're family. Spiritual family takes care of each other. And we're going to put that above anything else because that's what God wants us to do, care for one another. And, uh, but but don't, don't get, don't get caught. This, you know, this socialism thing, that, that term, the way I'm, I mean it to be, is a form of government to redistribute wealth. It doesn't work. It's wrong. It cannot work. Our culture is now we have social programs. I don't know if we'll ever get that stopped. They just need to have accountability and responsibility and as far as I'm concerned. And if I was a politician, if you would vote for me for governor, it'd be really good. Uh, I, I, would try to get, I would try to get 
local control, and I would try to I would try to to help people with accountability and responsibility, so that so there's answerable something answerable. I'm not saying all of our federal programs don't have that, but it's just so big. Even the best of intentions, it can't help but have a little bit of waste. It's just the way it is. All right, this has been good, hasn't it? Well, I tell you, Lowell hit a grand slam. Well, we're going to do another two-minute stand-up, and that's all I have to say. And I, I want to tell you, thank you for listening to me. Uh, it's my my deal to say uh, I've seen socialism firsthand and communism. It's the worst thing in the world. It's horrible. What it leads to is not here. So Tamara Scott's going to come, and uh, we'll take a take a quick break, a couple minutes.